with support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association, welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kim Caners. Human species has been around for about 200,000 years, and we've now reached a point where we have to make a decision as to whether the species is going to survive in anything like its current form of organization. Uh, There has never been a decision like that posed to humans before. We're risking the very future of our species, is how my guest today, Noam Chomsky, puts it, when it comes to the threat of climate change. And he pins the blame for the fact that we're racing over the precipice with seemingly little concern squarely on the rich and the powerful, and the peculiar institutional systems we've set up of politics and economics, where short-term profits somehow trump considerations for the future livability of our planet. The institutional requirement of short-term profit-making evidently overwhelms uh, concern for whether your grandchildren are going to have a chance for a decent existence. I don't know exactly what word to use for that. I'm not sure rationality is quite strong enough. Noam Chomsky is perhaps the world's best-known dissident and public intellectual. And at 87 years old, and after three quarters of a century of speaking out against all forms of inequality, state repression, and violence, he hasn't lost any of his outspokenness. All we can talk about is building pipelines. It's a sign of a a social and political system that is so sick that it cannot face obvious issues and deal with them sensibly. A few months ago on this program, I played another conversation I had with Noam Chomsky, one that I had recorded for a previous radio project. And in that conversation, we spoke about what activism could do in the fight against climate change. But given that he's been one of the world's most important thinkers and political voices, and how brilliantly he explains the institutional framework that lays behind understanding our current system and the woes it produces, when I had the opportunity to talk to him again, specifically for the elephant, I leapt at the chance. No, I'm on here in a minute, okay? Okay, thank you. So here's my conversation right. recorded last week with Noam Chomsky. Hi. Hi, Noam. I reached him at his office at MIT by Skype. Well, Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for joining me. You've recently said in a few different places that we're at an astonishing moment in human history. I was wondering if you could just explain briefly why you think that's the case. Why it is an astonishing moment in human history? Yeah. Well, Well... Human species has been around for about 200,000 years. And uh, up until this point, people have made decisions about their lives, their immediate futures, and so on. But we've now reached a point where we have to make a decision as to whether the species is going to survive in anything like its current form of organization and social systems uh, and uh, there are basically two uh, two fundamental questions uh, one is the question of nuclear war uh, which we know by now uh, we know by now that if there were a nuclear war between say two major powers uh, they would both be destroyed and so would everything else Uh, And we've been on the verge of that repeatedly for 70 years, and the threat is increasing again. So that's one decision. The other decision has to be made right now, even though the consequences will be several decades, maybe even a few generations away. And that has to do with climate change. Uh, If we do not make decisive steps right now, then we can be fairly confident that uh, within a pretty short time, maybe decades, maybe more, uh, there will be uh, irreversible and catastrophic consequences. Uh, There has never been a decision like that posed to humans before. Uh, Incidentally, we have already made the decision inadvertently for a huge number of species other than humans. So the destruction of species today 
as a result very substantially of uh, anthropogenic climate warming is about on the order of uh, what's called the fifth extinction 65 million years ago when an asteroid, huge asteroid, hit the Earth that's presumed to be the reason for the relatively sudden extinction of dinosaurs, end of the age of dinosaurs, uh, opening of the way for small mammals, which ultimately evolved into us, and now we are playing the role of the asteroid. So we've already decided that for millions of huge numbers of species, we've decided they're going to become extinct. And uh, we now have to make a similar decision about ourselves. It won't be extinction, but it might be catastrophic consequences. You know, one thing that always occurs to me when I hear you talk about the environmental crisis is how irrational it all is, or how irrational our collective behavior is. You point out that it's the rich and powerful and the existing power systems that are pushing us towards this precipice. Um, but even they will suffer uh, the consequences if there's a climate disruption. Their grandchildren will suffer. You know, they own land in Manhattan and Miami. Uh, the rich own estates in, you know, Long Island. So what do you think accounts for this seemingly uh, completely irrational behavior? It's a pretty striking phenomenon. So take a look at the... Uh presidential primaries that are underway in the United States. As I mentioned, there are these two huge problems. Uh, the first one, nuclear war, is barely mentioned in either primary. Few comments on it. On the Republican side, uh, there's just a commitment to greater militarization. Well, the Democrats, also the same, but not, not quite to that extent. Uh, but uh, the issue and the, the rising crisis and the, the almost miraculous escape for the last 70 years just isn't mentioned. Take climate change. On the Republican side, it's mentioned. It's denied. Every Republican candidate, with the single exception, Kasich, simply denies that it's happening. Kasich is worse. He's supposed to be the reasonable one. He says, sure, it's happening, but let's not do anything about it. I think that's even worse than denying it. So that's 100% on the Republican side saying, let's race to the precipice as quickly as possible. And this is not academic. It's already had an impact, significant impact. So uh, a couple of days ago, there was a signing of the, the United Nations of the uh, agreement reached in Paris last December, international agreement to restrict carbon dioxide emissions. But notice that the agreement was not a treaty. The intention was to have a verifiable treaty agreement that countries would commit themselves to live up to with penalties if they don't. Couldn't be done. And there was one simple reason, the Republican Congress it would simply not accept a treaty. So as a result, the Paris Agreement had to be a voluntary agreement, which means it's much weaker. And if, uh, say, suppose Donald Trump or in fact any other Republican were to win the election, uh, assuming they mean what they say, they would be essentially telling the world, don't do anything, doesn't matter build as many coal plants as you like, uh, because it's not happening anyway. I mean, if you want to talk about irrationality, it's pretty hard to go beyond this. Uh, I mean, there are more focused cases that we can look at. So, for example, it's now known that uh, the scientists at ExxonMobil uh, decades ago made it very clear to management that use of fossil fuels is it going to have lethal catastrophic effects. And they simply concealed it, in fact, lied about it. They organized major propaganda campaigns to convince people that it's not happening. And as you say, they have grandchildren. But uh, the institutional requirement of short-term profit-making evidently overwhelms 
uh, concern for whether your grandchildren are going to have a chance for a decent existence. Uh, I don't know exactly what word to use for that. I'm not sure irrationality is quite strong enough. It's really criminal immorality. At the same time, it always strikes me that you more than, than most dissidents appeal to, to rationality. You know, you don't, you don't, you're not uh, one to appeal to emotion very often. You, you really appeal to uh, listeners and readers' reason. And so I, I assume you do believe that as a species, we are capable of, of rationality, even though it seems that we so often don't follow that. We are capable of it, but uh, uh, you know it's it, it's not always a driving force in our existence. Actually, there are major efforts, huge efforts made to undermine rationality, and they're all they're right in front of us all the time. So every time you turn on a television set, you're being bombarded with massive efforts to turn you into an utterly irrational creature. Now, that's what the advertising industry is about. Uh, if you took a course in economics, you'd learn that uh, markets are based on informed consumers making rational choices. Uh, what's the advertising industry? It's an effort to create uninformed consumers making irrational choices. So if uh, if market systems really prevailed, uh, say General Motors it would have a short advertisement in which it would say, here are the characteristics of the cars we are selling next year. And here's what they say about it in consumer reports. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, what they do is try to produce some huge amount of effort and money it goes into creating illusions about, uh, you know, uh, famous sports hero is driving a car and it sails off into the stratosphere or something like that. The idea is to create illusions which will turn normal people into uninformed consumers who will be making highly irrational choices. And hundreds of billions of dollars a year are spent on this. This is a major part of the economy as an effort to do this. And uh, the now, the media system in, has some of that character as well. A lot of the deceit and distortion uh, are efforts, conscious or not, uh, to prevent people from being informed and in a position to make rational choices. So, for example, uh, take almost anything you pick. Uh, about a week ago, uh, Greenpeace released a couple of hundred pages that it had obtained somehow from the uh, transatlantic investor and trade agreement. This is being negotiated in secret, like all such trade agreements. And why is it negotiated in secret? To keep people from knowing about it. I mean, there are pretexts, but the real reason is simply to keep the public from knowing about it. And as soon as something leaks, you see why. It's described in the press all the time as a free trade agreement. It's not a free trade agreement. It's highly protectionist. A lot of it has nothing to do with trade. It has to do with investor rights, the rights of corporations to sue governments if they undertake uh, regulatory actions that might interfere with uh, future profits. Uh, none of this has anything to do with trade. It has to do with investor rights, very much like of the agreements that we already see, NAFTA, World Trade Organization, and so on. Uh, but the, the media consistently, that's close to 100%, refer to these things as free trade agreements. Uh, that's conscious or not. Maybe it's just unconscious to see. You just unconsciously go along with the dictates of power. Or maybe it's conscious to see. But it's an effort to prevent the citizenry from being informed and in a position to make rational decisions. And that happens over and over. Uh, so take just another example, almost at random. Uh, in the United States, uh, it's, in fact, much of the West, it's a kind of routine to describe Iran as the gravest threat to world peace. Uh, we have to put uh, 
missiles in uh, uh, Romania to protect uh, Europe from Iranians and so on. Uh, we have to have uh, extensive uh, controls to make sure that Iran doesn't uh, you know, do something that does, doesn't violate an agreement that we impose on it, because Iran is such a terrible danger to world peace, the worst danger. There's a world out there. The world has opinions, and the opinions are known. Uh, the major polling agencies, uh, U.S. polling agencies, uh, take polls of international opinion. And one of the questions they ask is, which country is the greatest threat to world peace? The Iran is barely mentioned. The country that is mentioned is the United States by a huge margin. That's regarded as the greatest threat to world peace. There's no other country that's even close. Do Americans know about this? No, because the media simply didn't publish it. That's citizens uninformed about crucial matters. I want to go back to, to climate change, because uh, this is a program specifically on, on climate change. And I was wondering, within the, within the climate change topic, there's a huge range of figures who are working on it. There's everyone from Al Gore to, to people who are saying we need an entirely new system and are trying to create new ways of, of living in order to solve climate change. And so I was, I was wondering what your thoughts are on if climate change can be solved within the current political and economic system. Um, it, can we meet this challenge within the, the system that we have, or do we, do we need, in a sense, a, a new system? Well, uh, it is possible to deal with climate change within the current state capitalist systems uh, by uh, carrying out measures uh, which are pretty well understood. So one measure that could be instituted immediately is a carbon tax. A carbon tax would at least uh, internalize the costs that are imposed by use of carbon. It would, it would impose a great burden on those who use fossil fuels. And even mainstream economists say this is the easiest way to do it. That's not going to end the crisis, but it would be a major step forward. Uh, is there a carbon tax? Uh, not in the United States even though, according to polls, almost half the population is, thinks it's a good idea. That's without practically anybody advocating it. If there was real advocacy, uh, in fact, almost all the commentary is against it. Well, nevertheless, uh, almost half the population is in favor of it. And uh, th that could be a significant step. It is certainly within the framework of existing institutions. Uh, this morning, if you look at the front page of the New York Times, it discusses a conflict that's arising in the Democratic Party between two of its major constituencies, environmental and labor. Uh, the labor constituency wants support for the building gas lines like Keystone XL. The environmental sector of the party is against it, so there's a split. And you can understand the problem. It's one of the reasons why uh, the white working class is drifting to the Republicans, to their major class enemy, literally, to the party that wants to really smash them in the face. But they're doing it because, uh, partly because the environmentalists in the Democratic Party are opposed to things like the XL pipeline. Is there a solution to this? Transparently, but it's not discussed. The, this country needs massive construction work on things like decaying infrastructure or uh, uh, high-speed rail, uh, all sorts of things that require an enormous amount of uh, labor. The capital is there. Workers want to work. Uh, can be done. It's not even raised. All we can talk about is building pipelines. Uh, going back to it. I don't know if the right word is irrationality again, but it's a sign of a, a social and political system that is so sick that it cannot face obvious issues and deal with them sensibly. So you have to tear the party apart over whether we're going to have pipelines when there's plenty of demand for labor and technical work, uh, 
construction work, uh, all kinds. I mean, even things like weatherization of homes, which is environmentally sound and could also be very helpful to the economy and provide jobs. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, government essentially nationalized the auto industry during the crisis, financial crisis, and took over practically the whole auto industry. There were choices at that point, but they were not discussed. One choice would be, should we hand the auto industry after the taxpayer bails it out, should we hand it back to the old owners or clones, maybe different faces, but the same, basically the same people, and have it continue to produce automobiles? That's one possibility. Another possibility was, uh, should we uh, have the industry directed not to producing more automobiles, but to producing a, an efficient mass transportation system? After all, this is the, about the only country that doesn't have anything like high-speed rail, uh, very inefficient mass transportation, which is very costly to the economy and very costly to individuals. And should the industry be handed over to the old owners, or should it be handed over to the workforce and, and the communities, uh, as a democratic society would do? These questions literally were not raised, except way out at the margins, like you know, I talk about them, a couple other people talk about them. But it's simply not part of the discussion. But it should be a critical part. I mean, it's kind of astonishing that uh, you can go from uh, China to Central Asia in high-speed rail, but you can't go from Boston to New York. In fact, the train from Boston to New York today, which is the pride of Amtrak, is maybe uh, 15 minutes faster than when I took it uh, 60, 70 or 65 years ago. It's a shock, if it even makes it on time, which half time doesn't do. Uh, these, are, um, these are even burdens on the rich. Well, Amtrak is mostly business people, but instead of getting to New York from Boston in you know, an hour and a half, they sit around for four hours. You said elsewhere that in order to, to deal with the environmental crisis, uh, we're going to have to dismantle an entire sociological, cultural, economic, and ideological structure, uh, which is dri driving us to disaster. And it can so often be hard to imagine when, when we're embedded within a system of what an alternative could look like. And I was wondering, I know you don't have any specific thoughts on, you know, what a society might look like, but do you have any general broad thoughts on the values or the overall structure that a society that was actually sustainable might look like? Yeah, it should be democratic. That's an alternative to our society. An alternative to our society is democracy. We live in plutocracies, not democracies. Uh, a democracy would mean that uh, every functioning institution, uh, production, commerce, uh, information, uh, all of them, it would simply be under popular democratic control. So uh, uh, industrial installations would be run by their workforce uh, in interaction with democratic communities. Is this a radical idea? Yeah, kind of, but it's also a mainstream idea. So if you take a look at the major U.S. social philosopher, John Dewey, straight out of mainstream America, I'm practically paraphrasing him. In fact, he points out that unless this is done, uh, politics will be, as he puts it, just the shadow cast on society by big business, which is pretty accurate. That's mainstream America. In fact, those ideas are not very much below the surface in ordinary people's consciousness. It's just out of the conversation. You cannot imagine democracy impermissible. Uh, but, but that is an alternative to our existing system. Uh, it's called, it's usually called libertarian socialism, but it's basically democracy. And along with that, do you also think that we need solidarity in order to solve the crisis? Solidarity? Well, that's an interesting question. And it's from a cultural and ideological point of view, it's pretty interesting to look at the history. So if you go back to the Enlightenment, and the origins of classical liberalism, 
and say people like Adam Smith or David Hume uh, and others, they simply took it for granted that solidarity, uh, sympathy, uh, mutual aid were core elements of human nature. They were the driving forces in human nature. In fact, take uh, Adam Smith's uh, famous phrase, invisible hand. The way it's interpreted is almost di diametrically opposite to the way he used it. In fact, he barely used it, but in one of the, only twice actually, and in one case, which is directly related to this, here's what he argues. Uh, he says, he was thinking of an agricultural economy, of course. So he said, suppose some landowner accumulates uh, almost all the land. So everybody else has to essentially be his servant. Uh, he says, well, this really won't matter very much because the landowner, by virtue of his sympathy for other people and concern for their needs, will make sure that property is distributed so that it will be relatively equal. So as if by an invisible hand, it will end up with a fair and relatively egalitarian society. Uh, not a very powerful argument, but it shows the, the kind of driving concept that underlies uh, uh, classical liberalism, enlightenment ideals, and so on. Now, all of that ended with capitalism. Adam Smith and David Hume and others are basically pre-capitalist. Capitalist ideology is different. It's get what you can for yourself and kick everyone else in the face. And now it's claimed that that's human nature. Is it? I don't think so. I think Adam Smith, David Hume, and others were basically correct. This is a distorting ideology which is imposed on us and undermines normal human emotions and interactions. It's highly distorting and deceitful. And going back to the uh, environmental crisis, that's what's causing us to race over the precipice. Uh, when ExxonMobil executives say, okay, let's lie about the fossil fuels, they're saying they're actually what they're doing is pursuing what Adam Smith denounced as, in his words, the vile maxim of the masters of mankind all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. And sometimes this is even explicit. Like uh, one uh, economist, famous economist, Nobel laureate, kind of an icon of the uh, right-wing libertarians, James Buchanan, who once said that the ideal situation for any person is to be the owner of everything and have everyone else be his slave. Can you imagine any non-pathological human being who could even dream of that idea? But from the point of view of uh, right-wing libertarian economics, you know, that's the ideal situation. That's what we really like. It's Ayn Rand, basically. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you one last question, which is, you know, the climate change uh, crisis can seem so overwhelming. It's easy to to feel despair. There's so much change that needs to happen really quickly if we're going to avoid really dire consequences. Um, but th there's also something that is also obvious um, from following the news over the past five years, let alone history, is that things are very unpredictable. It can be hard to predict what will happen. And I was wondering if you think this is where we should get some hope, is that the what will happen is, is quite unpredictable, that we, we can't tell what will happen. Well, I think there's plenty of grounds for hope. Uh, just take what I mentioned before, that even with, with almost no public support and plenty of articulate opposition, practically half the American population are still in favor of a carbon tax. In fact, uh, just about maybe every county in the United States, if you look at attitudes, so polls indicate that uh, people are in favor of more regulation of uh, of uh, uh, emissions. Uh, this is all latent attitudes, and the hope is that they can be turned into a powerful, organized, popular force, which very quickly will compel 
the leadership or else replace the leadership or even replace the institutions and, and institute the policies that have to be carried out right now means essentially ending the use of fossil fuels and pretty quickly. Uh, can be done. There are alternatives. Well, they can be developed more. And it's, uh, it's the way to save the, to, to, to put a break on this race to disaster and offer decent possibilities for future survival. And are you optimistic we can do that? That we can meet this challenge as a species? Am I optimistic? Yeah. Well, I think we should simply continue to keep in mind the slogan that Antonio Gramsci made famous, that we can have uh, pessimism of the intellect, but we should have optimism of the will, and there's plenty of grounds for it, and we should grasp the hopes and opportunities that do exist, and make sure that they become implemented and operative. Well, Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks. That was my conversation with professor and political thinker, Noam Chomsky. And that's it for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is made with support from the Climate Kick, that's KIC Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. Our website is elephantpodcast.org, where we have all of our past episodes. And to keep up to date, you can like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And before we sign off, one last word from Noam Chomsky. And actually, could I just get you to give one last comment? We know the Republican stance on climate change. Could you comment on how you view Hillary Clinton's stance on climate change? Hillary Clinton? Well, she hasn't talked about it much, but I suspect her position would be pretty much like Obama's, which is some steps, infinitely better than the Republican stance, some steps, but not sufficient ones. And what would then be required is substantial, powerful public pressure to turn these some steps into major steps. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you next time.